This podcast is for information purposes only, and it does not constitute medical advice. If you have any health or medical concerns, please contact your doctor or family physician. Welcome to episode three of Flexibility Focus, the podcast for all things flexibility. I'm your host, Dan Van Zandt, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in today. This installment continues the Components of Flexibility series, in which I talk about the different physiological dimensions and biomechanical properties that comprise flexibility. In episode two, I discuss the property of extensibility, which is how much soft tissues like muscle fibers can extend or stretch. I also discussed several of the prominent theories which have been proposed by different researchers over the years to explain how tissues stretch and why increases in flexibility occur, and I went over some of the strengths and weaknesses of those theories. In this episode, I'm going to talk about another biomechanical property of flexibility, and that is the property called stiffness. If you remember, in episode 2, I explained there are four principal physiological dimensions of soft tissues that we analyse during a stretch. Those four dimensions are length, tension, cross-sectional area, and time. And each of those dimensions gives us biomechanical properties that, when we put them together, gives us a much clearer picture of what happens to tissues during stretching. The dimension of length gives us only the property of extensibility, which was covered in the last episode. The dimension of tension gives us several different properties, and I'll discuss the first of those, stiffness, as well as its reciprocal property compliance in part one of this episode. If you've already listened to previous episodes, you'll know what the rest of the show will look like. In part two, I'll review a piece of research literature and offer my thoughts on its implications for flexibility training. In part three, I'll discuss three books that might help you in your flexibility training. And in part four, I'll shine the spotlight on three people in the health and fitness industry who are putting out great content on social media. Finally, in part five, I'll answer some questions from the audience. As always, please show your support by liking and subscribing if your favourite podcasting platform allows it. Please note that you can now listen to the podcast on many different platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Anchor, Breaker and Overcast. Please also help me to fulfil my goal of getting the good science to more people by sharing the podcast with your friends. The podcast is only a little over a month old, but already we're starting to see more and more people questioning the bad science that exists in the industry. With your help, we can continue to close the gap between the good science and the industry. Don't forget, there are also a number of minisodes available to listen to right now. The minisodes are a companion show in which I interview people in the health and fitness industry, many of whom have previously featured in the spotlight segment of the main episodes. Be sure to check them out at some point too. All right, let's get on with part one. Welcome to part one. Today we're learning about the component of flexibility called stiffness. As I explained in the last episode, and also in the introduction of this episode, stiffness is one of the four biomechanical properties that come under the umbrella of tension. Tension is a physiological dimension of human movement, so stiffness is a biomechanical property of the physiological dimension called tension. In the last episode, I briefly explained the difference between a dimension and a property, but I'll go over it again here just to serve as a reminder. A dimension is essentially an aspect or a feature of an object, and it's typically used to describe the relationship between various physical properties. A physical property is any characteristic of an object which we can measure, and in which that measurement enables us to describe the state of a physical system. A physical system is just any part of the physical universe that we've chosen to analyse. In the context of movement, the physical system that we're analysing, or the portion of the physical universe that we're analysing, is the human body and its constituent parts. And we measure changes in the physical properties of a system so that we're able to describe changes in the system between momentary states. In the case of flexibility, we measure changes in the physical properties of the body during movement and stretching so that we can better describe the body's changes between momentary states. Put simply, physical properties are the parts of a system that we can measure, and dimensions are the categories that these properties are divided into. Let's look at an example. 
If the completion of a given task or skill requires you to display a specific range of motion at speed, then we're describing a change in the state of your body's motion from static to dynamic. And it's important that we're able to describe the state of motion because that allows us to determine the type of exercise that will allow you to develop that specific range of motion you need at the specific speed you need to do it so that you can successfully complete the task or skill, i.e. so that you can successfully navigate and manipulate the external environment around you. Remember, flexibility is speed specific because there are two types of stretch receptors that are present in your muscles. These two types of receptors are called nuclear chain fibers and nuclear bag fibers. It's this second type of receptor, the nuclear bag fiber, which detects both the magnitude and the speed of the stretch. So nuclear bag fibers are sensitive to both length and velocity. And velocity just means speed in a specific direction. We have to consider velocity because it allows us to train in a way that equips us to be able to better handle force, which is vital for both performance and reducing injury. And again, this highlights why the active versus passive model of joint motion is not sufficient to describe movement. Many people from personal trainers to physiotherapists only ever talk about active and passive range of motion, but this only tells us whether the muscles are, are contracting or relaxing. It tells us nothing about the velocity or the speed of movement. And the law of specificity states that exercises that are designed to develop dynamic range of motion, which is range of motion when you're moving, must reach at least 75% of the maximum speed of the given task or skill in order to effectively increase dynamic flexibility. If you don't, you will not be able to demonstrate your flexibility at speed, which is important in most sports, but it's especially true in disciplines like martial arts and dance. And this is why people who can do the splits just fine, but who don't do dynamic stretching at the required velocities are unable to perform movements like high kicks. This rule even applies to people who have incredible flexibility strength and who can hold themselves in a split while suspended between two chairs like Jean-Claude Van Damme. This is because the amount of force that you can produce in static stretches or in very slow moving stretches will only take you so far, no matter how strong you are in those positions, because while static flexibility has some carryover to dynamic flexibility, the law of specificity states that if you want to be able to so safely demonstrate that range of motion at speed, then you have to train that range of motion at speed. I'll use joint rotations as, as an example. So joint rotations have been a staple exercise in martial arts and dance for eons, but they've become increasingly popular in mainstream health and fitness in recent years. Like I said in episode one, joint rotations are just dynamic active stretches performed in the direction of rotation. But many people do them only very slowly because they think that they're preparing their joints to go into ranges of motion that they're not used to, and thus they think they're helping to prevent injury. And that theory sounds plausible on the surface, but when you dive deeper and look at it from a scientific perspective, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. If you only ever do your joint rotation slowly, no matter how much tension you're able to voluntarily produce, then you're not adequately preparing the tissues to handle the forces they'll be exposed to when they move or get moved into extended positions at speed. This is because as your limbs move quickly into extended positions and the tissues lengthen, the force in the tissues increases dramatically. This is called an eccentric contraction. In eccentric muscle contractions, the muscle resists the stretching load. As the muscle resists the stretching load, the attached actin and myosin cross bridges themselves are stretched, which adds to the overall tension so that the force produced by the muscle is greater than its isometric strength. And isometric strength is simply the force a muscle can produce when it contracts, but doesn't change length, which is called an isometric contraction. The third type of contraction is, of course, a concentric or shortening contraction, which is what most people think of when they talk about flexing their muscles. Studies have shown that eccentric contractions produce far more force than both isometric and concentric contractions, up to three times more force than in a concentric contraction, in fact. The force that a muscle produces during an eccentric contraction depends on its speed of lengthening or its velocity. The greater the speed of lengthening, the greater the effect on the stretch reflex, and therefore the greater the force produced by the muscle. We call this the force-velocity relationship, which is illustrated by a curve, and the curve will show that at any particular length, 
the greater the speed of shortening, the lower the tension, and the greater the speed of lengthening, the higher the tension. And this is why no matter how hard you try to tense your muscles during your slow joint rotations, you won't be able to match the same level of tension that will be produced when you move your joints fast. So there's two reasons here why should we, we should do joint rotations fast. Number one, to be able to display the required range of motion at speed, because you can't do that by doing just static or very slow movements. And number two, to expose the tissues to force and increase their tolerance, because you can't do that either by doing just static or very slow movements. By all means, do your joint rotations slowly in the beginning when you're first learning them as a skill, but once you've sufficiently learned how to disassociate one joint from the other during movement, then the slow joint rotations are really only useful as a warm-up to doing fast joint rotations. If you want to use joint rotations to protect yourself against injury, which is why a lot of people do them in the first place, then you should build up to doing several sets with a progressive rate of motion, meaning that the speed increases with each subsequent set until your final set is done at a speed of at least 75% of your maximum possible speed. This all forms part of the biomechanical model of flexibility, which I've been teaching for over 20 years now, and which forms the backbone of the material that I'm sharing with you in this podcast. And really, we need to take a biomechanical view of everything related to movement in the human organism because at its most fundamental level, biomechanics is the study of force in the body. Remember, a force is simply a push or a pull caused by the interaction of two bodies, which tries to change the motion of a body. So a biomechanical view of flexibility and the other motor abilities is essentially looking at human biology through the lens of physics. A physics first approach to movement and exercise is something I think every trainer, coach and therapist needs to adopt because biology adheres to the laws of physics. Physics is the tool which allows us to understand force and force is the thing which drives all movement and injury in the body. In fact, force is the thing which drives everything in the physical universe from the largest scale and the densest supermassive black holes like M87, which has a mass 4 billion times that of our sun, and where gravity, which is the attraction between two bodies that have mass or energy, is so strong that it generates forces capable of tearing space and time to shreds, all the way down to the smallest scale, like the strong nuclear force, which at 6,000 trillion, trillion, trillion times stronger than gravity, that's the number 6 followed by 39 zeros, is actually the strongest force in the universe. It's what holds together the fundamental particles of matter like protons and neutrons in the nucleus of every atom, uh, although the most common form of hydrogen, which is the most abundant substance in the universe, doesn't actually have any neutrons. But the point I'm making here is force is the language of the universe, and biomechanics, which is a branch of biophysics and ultimately physics, is the translator we use to understand how the universe speaks to the human body. And so understanding the biomechanical properties that comprise flexibility, such as extensibility, which we covered in the last episode, and stiffness, which we cover in this episode, endows us with an increased capacity to understand how the body responds to force and how it interacts with the world around it. So what is stiffness? Well, unfortunately, stiffness is one of the most misunderstood concepts of flexibility because the term stiffness is used interchangeably to describe several different concepts and It can mean different things to different people. In fact, when you look at the research literature, the word stiffness is used interchangeably more times than any other term in the flexibility technical vocabulary. Some of the things that typically come to mind when people hear the word stiffness or stiff are things like feelings of tightness, uh, feeling tense, feeling sore, or just their own body's resistance or reluctance to stretch further. And This is why it's so important to read more than just the abstract of a paper or an article, which is a mistake many people make when they consume research, because until you read at least the introduction and methods, you can't really be sure what it is the authors are referring to when they describe stiffness. Largely, however, stiffness is used in the literature to describe two principal phenomena. The first is that of neurological tightness, also called neural tension, which is when either a dynamic or static stretch stimulates the muscle spindles and Alpha motor neurons cause a reflexive contraction of the stretched muscles to prevent the joint or the limb from moving any further. Sometimes with neurological tightness or neurotension, the entire muscle will feel very firm to the touch even when the muscle is at rest. I won't go into any more detail on neurological tightness because, as I said in the last episode, I'm covering the mechanical components first because uh, before 
the neural components because the mechanical components are easier to understand. So I'll talk about neurological tightness in a future episode. The uh, second phenomena is mechanical stiffness, which is what I'm discussing in this episode. So what is mechanical stiffness? Well, in material science, stiffness is the rigidity of an object or the extent to which it resists deformation in response to an applied force. And that definition is more or less the same in biomechanics. And the object we're analysing, of course, is the muscle and tendon. More specifically, in biomechanics and flexibility, Stiffness is the change in force divided by deformation, but what is deformation? Deformation is simply the change in shape of the material, or the change in shape of the muscle and tendon. In the case of stretching, we see a longitudinal change in shape, or a change in the length of the muscle or tendon. It's the amount of force it takes to cause a change in the shape of the material, i.e. it's the amount of force it takes to cause the muscle or tendon to lengthen. The more force that's required to stretch the muscle or tendon, the stiffer it is. Conversely, the less force that's required to stretch the muscle or tendon, the less stiff or more compliant it is. And I'll talk more about compliance in a short while. But stiffness or the change in force divided by the change in shape is also called the ratio of stress to strain. But what does stress and strain mean? Well, the word stress means the loading that's being applied to the body and the size and direction of the stress cause deformations or changes in shape um, of the material within the body and we call this strain. The word strain simply means the measure of how the stress or the applied force is distributed over the internal structures of the body. It's important to point out here that where injury is concerned it's actually strain rather than force directly which is responsible for injury but by increasing our tolerance to forces we increase our ability to mitigate injury so While it's strain which is responsible for injury, for the sake of easier understanding, we still say force is what causes all movement and injury in the body. Again, stiffness is nothing more than the ratio which describes how, when force increases, deformation or length also increases. In simpler terms, it's called the resistance to stretch. Stiffer materials have a higher resistance to stretch, and less stiff materials have a lower resistance to stretch. But it's important to remember that the amount of deformation or change in shape that occurs depends on the material being stretched. With muscle in particular, the amount of resistance to stretch depends on both neural and mechanical factors, whereas stiffness of connective tissue structures like tendon is primarily mechanical in nature. In most studies, you will see stiffness illustrated using a stress-strain curve. On the stress-strain curve, the x-axis, or the horizontal line running along the bottom, represents strain, which is the deformation or the change in length, sometimes labelled as elongation. The y-axis, or the vertical line running up the side, represents stress, or the load that's being applied to the tissues. The curve, or the line, on the stress-strain curve has three distinct parts. The first part of the curve is called the toe region which in the case of tendons, for example, is where the crimped collagen fibrils straighten out up to a maximum of about 2% tolerable strain. The second part of the curve is called the linear region. And in the example of tendons again, this is where the collagen fibrils orient themselves in the direction of pull and really begin to stretch. It's the straightest line on the curve. And because the tissues demonstrate elasticity in this region, meaning that the deformation or the change in shape of the tissues is reversible and the tissues will return to their original shape, we also sometimes call this part of the curve the elastic region. The third and final part of the curve is called the failure region. This is the part which starts where the elastic region ends at a point called the yield point. This is the physical limit of the tissue's ability to stretch where intramolecular crosslinks fail, hence the name failure region. If this failure continues to build up, the tissues will experience irreversible plastic deformation. Now, if you remember in the last episode, I explained that plastic deformation is synonymous with a permanent change in the shape of tissues and is often a cause of pain and weakness. Uh, So uh, those are the three parts of the stress-strain curve, the toe region or the initial straightening out of the fibrils, the linear region or the amount the tissue can stretch before irreversible deformation occurs, and the failure region, or when irreversible deformation takes place. Um, 
stiffness is represented by the linear region or the straightest line on the curve. So this means we can look at a stress strain curve, we can point to the linear region or the straight line on the curve, and we can say that's the muscle stiffness or that's the tendon stiffness. But how do we interpret the curve? How do we know if the tissue is displaying high stiffness or low stiffness? It's very simple. A tissue with a steep line has a high stiffness. For example, we know bone is very rigid. It's not completely rigid because it does have a small degree of elasticity to it, but when you look at a stress strain curve for bone, you'll see the curve rises very sharply. So we say that a bone is very stiff or it has a high stiffness. Conversely, a tissue with a gentle slope or a curve that rises gradually has less stiffness and therefore it'll display relatively more deformation than a stiffer tissue. Generally speaking, when we look at the gradual slope of a flexible muscle, we can say that it has greater compliance than a less flexible muscle and is therefore less stiff. Now, I need to clarify some points here regarding the usage of the terms compliance, extensibility and flexibility because some authors confuse them and quite often. So compliance is the inverse or the reciprocal of stiffness or its opposite. So a compliant tissue has low stiffness and a stiff tissue has low compliance. Um, like I said, some authors use compliance to describe other phenomena. And the most, the most common example that you'll see in the literature is they'll use the word compliance to describe how far a tissue can stretch or extend, but that isn't correct. If you already listened to the last episode, you'll know that the term we use to describe how much a tissue can stretch or extend is extensibility. So extensibility is a measure of how far the tissue can stretch, whereas compliance is a measure of how it easily they can stretch. So compliance directly influences extensibility. Greater compliance means less stiffness and therefore greater extensibility and less compliance means greater stiffness and therefore less extensibility. The interchangeability between the terms compliance and flexibility is a little more complicated however and it primarily depends on what lens the person is looking through. Most often when people com confuse compliance with flexibility they're looking through the lens of material science rather than biomechanics. Material science is the branch of science that combines physics, chemistry and engineering and deals primarily with solid matter, so solid matter objects like buildings and machines. For obvious reasons, that isn't a lens through which we should be looking at the human body. Um, but as I said earlier, stiffness is how much an object resists deformation in response to an applied force and that definition is true for both material science and biomechanics. In material science, the inverse of stiffness is flexibility, also called pliability, spelt P-L-I-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y. Uh, but of course, biomechanics is our lens, and in biomechanics, the opposite of stiffness is compliance. So put simply, compliance is in biomechanics what pliability is in material science. It's the opposite of stiffness. And as you'll know from episode one, flexibility in biomechanics is the motor ability, which determines the capacity of your joints to change position, i.e. their ability to move. Uh, stiffness and its counterpart compliance are both components of flexibility. And remember, these components of flexibility that I'm describing are simply the mechanical behaviors of the body's tissues that influence flexibility. You know, a moment or a few moments ago, I said, that generally speaking, when we look at a stress strain curve and we see a slope that rises gradually, we're looking at less stiffness uh, and therefore a more compliant tissue. So we can say that the tissue is more flexible. However, and this is the part where it gets a little bit more confusing, but it's important to bear in mind that this is not always the case. You can have a very large range of motion and still have very, very stiff tissues or you can have a, a very small range of motion and have very compliant tissues. Range of motion and stiffness are not always directly proportional to one another. And this is because range of motion is not always limited by tissue stiffness. Limited range of motion can be caused by either mechanical factors or sensory factors, but in many cases it's both. So generally speaking, when you see a steep line on the stress strain curve and you're looking at a stiff muscle, most of the times it will mean that um, you're looking at an inflexible muscle too, meaning that it's got a limited range of motion alongside a high stiffness. 
and vice versa. A lot of the time you'll find that muscles crossing joints that have a high range of motion typically are also very compliant. But because stiff or compliant muscles and tendons are not always a limiting factor in range of motion, this is one of the reasons why people jumped on the sensory theory as the sole reason to explain um, how stretching increases flexibility because there were a number of experiments which showed range of motion changed without a change in stiffness, which meant there was no structural change in the muscle tendon complex. And so the researchers hypothesized that Stretching created only a change in stretch tolerance or how much you can put up with the discomfort of stretching. And stretch tolerance, aka sensory theory, is a psychophysiological phenomenon. And many people who don't like stretching lauded these studies and claimed they were proof positive that there's only a sensory alteration rather than a structural one. But for some illogical reason, they also claimed that this was a valid reason to discount stretching from training and rehabilitation as a means for increasing flexibility, which we know isn't true because most studies that investigate static passive stretching demonstrate increases in range of motion. But the argument that stretching doesn't decrease stiffness falls apart when you realize there are studies that show long-term stretching, i.e. stretching over a number of weeks does decrease stiffness. So again, it's likely that both neural and mechanical factors have a part to play. Uh, however, there are studies which have shown that long-term stretching can not only increase range of motion, but it can also increase stiffness too. Now, if all this seems confusing, it's because it is. For every study that finds that the mechanical behavior of the tissues changes, there is another study that finds there was no change in stiffness. So like I said in the previous episode, the jury is still out on what it is exactly that causes increases in range of motion, including the sensory theory. The main issue is to do with how stiffness is defined by each individual research paper and how stiffness is measured. Uh, first of all, there's dynamic and passive stiffness. Dynamic stiffness, which is more often called dynamic impedance, is a property of a physical system that maps the time history of displacement or the change in joint angle onto the time history of force or the torque. And it includes resistance to motion related displacement, velocity, acceleration and any other dynamic factors. It all, If it all sounds complicated, it's, it's because it is. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of studies that examine dynamic stretching don't bother to examine dynamic stiffness and why most studies examining stiffness tend to use, utilize static stretching to examine passive and active stiffness. In a static state, stiffness is the constant proportionality that relates um, steady displacement to steady force. And this is the most common definition of stiffness, i.e. the resistance to deformation by a stretching force. Uh, a moment ago, I mentioned passive and active stiffness, and this is the main way that stiffness is categorized. Passive stiffness is the resistance to elongation, and in physical terms, this means the change in tension to uh, the change in tension per unit change in length, which I've already discussed. In biological terms, it means the passive mechanical tension provided by a combination of the joint, tendon, and connective tissue. Passive mechanical tension is generated when a passive, i.e. not contracting muscle, is lengthened, uh, which is believed to come from the series elastic and parallel elastic elements of the muscle. Uh, for example, the tendon, the structural proteins within the muscle cells, um, and the connective tissue around the muscle fibers and the fascicles, which we call fascia, spelt F-A-S-C-I-A. Conversely, active stiffness is a function of voluntary and reflexive muscular contraction. Um, there is another property of stiffness called intrinsic joint stiffness, which um, provides an immediate torque response to any change in joint angle without any intervention needed from the nervous system. Another way to think of intrinsic joint stiffness is that it's the instantaneous mechanical stiffness provided by the combination of um, muscle, tendon and connective tissue, i.e. fascia. There's some evidence that suggests the nervous system controls or at least plays a part in controlling intrinsic joint stiffness, but there are other researchers who argue that it isn't under neural control, but rather it's a constant biomechanical property. Um, again, active stiffness is a neural component of flexibility, so I'll discuss that more specifically in a future episode. But with regards to passive stiffness, there are different objective quantitative methods we can use to measure passive stiffness, um, including perturbations of torque or angular displacement, 
and measuring the resulting angular displacements or torques. For example, one study used a controlled robot device to apply stretches to the muscles at different velocities to distinguish the um, contribution of active reflex mechanisms from passive muscle properties. And the authors of that study defined passive stiffness as the applied torque recorded at the slowest stretch velocity, um, which I think was eight degrees per second, um, at which no stretch reflex response was elicited. Generally speaking, however, the term stiffness frequently refers to the resistance to stretch or how much force it takes to stretch the tissues. Most often, lower stiffness means more range of motion and higher stiffness means less range of motion. But bear in mind, it's not always the case because there are many factors influencing how much a joint can move. I'm going to leave the discussion of stiffness there for now. Um, I'll discuss how different methods of stretching and exercise alter stiffness, meaning you can train to either reduce or increase stiffness depending on your goals. But I'll do that in another episode because I think that's enough information about stiffness for you to get your teeth into for now. Welcome to part two, the research review. I'm taking a slight side step from analysing an article that appeared in a peer review journal and I'm instead going to look at a PhD thesis. When it comes to the literature, if a piece of work hasn't appeared in a peer review journal such as a PhD thesis, it's still considered student work and so it tends not to be given the same merit as published work, which when you think about it, it's a bit silly because the PhD thesis could have performed a study that was just as robust as a peer reviewed article. Today's piece of literature is something that I've actually read a couple of times and I think it's excellent work. Uh, I was prompted to include it in this episode after a conversation I had with an osteopath and physiotherapist called David Josephson. Um, he wrote to me in response to a statement I made in the last episode where I said that the effects of rigorous stretching lasting more than eight weeks hadn't been adequately investigated in the literature. And that statement is true. When you examine the literature, the longer studies tend to run for about eight weeks. And when you consider the lifespan of the average human being, eight weeks barely qualifies as long term. But Mary Moltubach, now Dr. Moltubach, conducted a study for her PhD in sports biomechanics, which lasted for 24 weeks or six months. Now, you won't find her doctoral thesis on any of the research databases like Google Scholar or PubMed, again, because it's classed as student work. Instead, I'll give you the link to her thesis here. The link is http colon forward slash forward slash hdl dot h a n d l e dot n e t forward slash one one two five zero forward slash two five eight one zero three six i'll include that address in the captions and description box on instagram facebook and youtube so dr multibach's thesis looked at what the effects of 24 weeks of stretching had on the hamstring and calf the calf being comprised of the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles. She looked at the results of tests of muscle tendon unit morphology from two separate studies, one of elite level rhythmic gymnasts, the other of professional ballet dancers, which are populations who have years of intense flexibility training behind them. And she compared them to a group of recre re recreationally active adults who had no history of flexibility training. The group of recreationally active adults performed four sets of 60 second stretches each of the calf muscles in the plane of ankle dorsiflexion, which is where you bring the toes up towards your shin, and also of the hamstring muscles in the plane of knee flexion. The participants were permitted to spread the stretches throughout the day, so they weren't necessarily performed in one single session. What Dr. Moltebach found after six months was that range of motion in ankle dorsiflexion increased by 12 degrees and in knee flexion by 10 degrees. Those results might not sound like much, but remember static passive stretching is very slow compared to isometric, eccentric, and loaded stretching. Practically speaking, a rational flexibility training program will include all types of stretching, not just static passive stretching in isolation. All methods of stretching work best when performed together, i.e. isometric stretches are more effective when followed by relaxed stretches than when isometric stretches are performed in isolation. Often when people say static passive stretching doesn't work, what they should be saying is that it just takes a long time to see results, which most people will know from personal experience, but it still works. These results are similar to other studies, which um, held studies for just 30 seconds. So 
more long-term studies like this one, which last several months rather than just several weeks, are needed to determine which duration of stretching is more effective. Interestingly, in Dr. Moltebeck's study, dorsiflexion range of motion increased by 4 degrees in the control leg, meaning the leg which the participants didn't stretch also increased its flexibility even without stretching. This could be due to the bilateral transfer effect, which means that training in one limb produces some results in the opposite limb, even if you don't train the opposite limb. Um, any increases in the contralateral limb are likely to be entirely neural in nature because the control limb wasn't subjected to the, to the same mechanical forces that the intervention limb faced. Um, however, we also can't discount that the increase in range of motion in the control limb was due to systematic errors, so take that 4 degrees increase in range with a pinch of salt. The recreationally active group didn't increase their range of motion to a level similar to the dancers, which is probably due to the longitudinal training experience of the dancers, and it might indicate that the recreationally active group may still have some capacity for increasing range of motion even further. Self-perceived pain or stretching discomfort decreased from the start of the study to the eight-week eight point, with no further decreases in pain from the eight-week point to the end of the study. The fact that range of motion continued to increase past the eight-week point despite no change in self-perceived pain indicated that stretching still works even though the tolerance to stretch might not change. From the 16-week point to the end of the study, there wasn't a significant change in range of motion which might be caused either by diminished effective stretching or because the most flexible participants had reached or were reaching the anatomical limitations of the joints. In the recreationally active group, both muscle and tendon extensibility increased, but not tick, but not tissue architecture, um, indicating that the changes shown in this study were caused by neural factors rather than structural alterations. All in all, this was a very thorough study, and one which I hope will lead the way in terms of future research into long-term stretching. Um, remember, increases in static flexibility tend to occur over weeks and months rather than days. Um, I'm hoping at some point I can get Dr. Moulter back onto the show for an interview to discuss her thoughts and opinions on flexibility training and research. But for now, you can follow her on Instagram by searching for at Mary Moulterback. That's at M-A-R-I-E-M-O-L-T-U-B-A-K-K. -K. Welcome to part three, the book review. The first book I'm reviewing today is one for all you dancers out there. By the way, if you're a dancer, be sure to listen to my interview with Charlotte Tooth, a former dancer turned fitness instructor. We had a fantastic talk and there were some real gems in there for dancers and the interview appeared in Minisode number four, which aired on June the 9th. So this book is called Dance Medicine in Practice, Anatomy, Injury Prevention and Training, which was written by Leanne Simmel and the English language edition was published by Routledge in 2014. The book offers good information on anatomy and physiology relevant to dance, including the 3D function of important structures like the spine, pelvis, knee, and so forth. Uh, most beneficial for dancers, I believe, are the sections which discuss common issues that occur in, this, in these structures uh, during dance training, and Simmel offers some effective strategies for, for treatment and rehabilitation. There's also some very informative sections on nutrition, dance during periods of physical growth, how to cope with injuries, as well as how to plan training. Um, the second book should be a staple of all health and fitness trainers and therapists. It's The Science and Practice of Strength Training by Vladimir Zatsiorsky, William Kramer and Andrew Fry. The third edition was published by Human Kinetics just over a week ago, so this new edition is literally fresh off the press. Uh, the book offers a brilliant overview of the basic concepts of strength training and the authors discuss various theories that explain how humans get stronger, with adaptation being the main law of training. And what this main law means is that if training is planned and executed proper, uh, properly, then systematic exercise will cause an improvement in a person's physical fitness, especially strength, as the body adapts to physical load. As part of this law, the authors stress the importance of understanding maladaptation and how to, how to avoid potentially negative consequences of doing too much too soon. The book explains how to manage training intensity and timing, 
how to select appropriate exercises, how to actually train velocity, because let's be honest, there's a lot of fluff and nonsense out there in the health and fitness industry when it comes to actual velocity training. Um, the sections on how to program strength training for women, young athletes and senior athletes in particular are worth the, the, the book's cover price. The last book to be reviewed in today's episode is Movement, Functional Movement Systems, Screening, Assessment and Corrective Strategies by Gray Cook, one of the bigger names of the movement industry in the last 20 years. Um, other authors include Lee Burton, Kyle Kiesel, Greg Rose and Milo Bryant. The book is something of a Bible in strength and conditioning circles, primarily due to the popularity of the functional movement screen or FMS which is a systematic approach to assessing a person's movement quality, which was, de- which was designed by Cook, and it forms the backbone of the book. The book presents a series of different exercises and tests that you can use to determine how well someone can move using their own body weight, because Cook states that it's important to establish that a person can function properly before we allow them to pick up a weight, or as Cook puts it, adding load on top of dysfunction. Um, Cook coined another very popular phrase, first move well, then move often, which is a tone he sets throughout the book. And these are generally good ideas, but it's important to remember that you don't necessarily have to be able to perfect a bodyweight squat before you do a loaded squat. Um, Oftentimes, a person who performs a very bad looking bodyweight squat can perform uh, a textbook quality squat when you hand them a kettlebell or a barbell with a little bit of load on it. Um, Obviously, This doesn't mean that a person who has a terrible looking squat should then go and try to lift 500 kilos, but just because someone moves poorly without load doesn't mean they will move poorly uh, with load. The answer, in my opinion, is to have them do both. Keep the load light during assessment, but don't be scared of adding a little bit of extra weight, even though you think the person's squat is uglier than a frog's asshole. The FMS itself uses a number system from zero to three, depending on how well a person performs the tasks. A low score means poorer movement quality, a higher score means better movement quality. Um, Many people have claimed that a high FMS score equates to a lower chance of injury, but this has been disproven in research which examined the ability of the FMS to predict injury rates. The book promotes a philosophy of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, or a patterns versus parts approach, in which Cook states that we should screen and assess patterns first, And only then we should judge the parts within the most limited patterns as primary problems. And this is a sentiment I generally agree with, although my personal approach to screening and assessment is to check the range of motion in every joint, as well as the quality of movement patterns during my initial initial consultation with every client that I deal with. So my personal approach is a patterns and parts approach. There has been a lot of argument in the health and fitness industry recently with certain people claiming that we need to just assess the movement capacities of each joint rather than the quality of movement patterns because apparently if your joints don't function like a joint then you don't have a joint which is yet again another stupid catchphrase. So there's this debate raging at the moment about whether we should adopt a patterns first approach to movement assessment or a parts first approach to movement assessment. The point that Cook makes and it's a valid one is that a person might display limited range of motion in an individual joint during a joint assessment, but when they perform the movement pattern, they can display the movement just fine. The problem with the parts first or joint first approach is that a practitioner or coach will have you spend ridiculous amounts of time training your joints individually until they can fulfill some arbitrary numerical value before they'll permit you to train the pattern, which is silly. Because very recently I had a client who was unable to display what we would call normal range of motion, in inverted commas, in her ankles during the individual joint assessment. Yet when she squatted, she had all the range of motion she needed to do a so-called proper squat without any negative compensations in any of the joints. And just last week she hit an ass to heels double body weight squat for five reps. And she still can't pass the individual joint assessment for her ankles. And even if she did compensate for her lack of ankle dorsiflexion flexibility in other joints when she squatted, there are ways to train the squat and improve ankle dorsiflexion at the same time. You do not have to wait to make sure your joint flexibility meets the arbitrary numerical value before you can start training patterns. In truth, I think the answer to this debate lies somewhere in the middle. Check both patterns and parts and deal with both at the same time. Good training is efficient and so is good assessment and treatment.
Welcome to part four, where I shine the spotlight on people doing great things on social media. For full disclosure, please know that none of the people featured in this segment of the podcast have ever asked me to feature them, nor have I ever been paid to feature anyone. The first anyone knows that I've featured them is when I tag them in the captions on Instagram when I'm advertising the podcast episode. First up today is Jeffrey Wolf, aka The Flexible. Jeffrey's the head flexibility coach at Athletic Truth Group, a gym in Florida that has perhaps one of the best teams of coaches that I've ever seen. The philosophy of flexibility training that Jeffrey promotes is one that I wholeheartedly agree with, and it's one that states that flexibility develops fastest when you build strength through the full range of motion. Jeffrey also dispels many of the myths that exist in the industry, like rounding your back under load is bad for you. It's not, and Jeffrey and his clients are living proof of that. Jeffrey's always putting out great content. Um, go check him out. His handle is at the flexible. That's at T H E F L E X I B U W L. Next up is Lucas Aaron, also known as Range of Strength. Lucas is a former competitive powerlifter whose approach to flexibility is again similar to Jeffrey's and one that I fully endorse, and it focuses on building strength through length. Lucas's description of flexibility as being your range of strength is precisely what I was talking about in episode one of the podcast, when I discussed how biomotor abilities interact and how flexibility strength, written as flexibility dash strength, is a display of both your flexibility and your strength. Lucas is a coach for Real Movement, which is a group started by a really cool dude called Keegan Smith, and those guys are relentless at pushing out fantastic content. Um, Lucas and Jeffrey actually collaborate quite a lot of the time and they've done a few episodes together on Lucas's brilliant podcast also called Range of Strength which I implore you to go out and listen to. The guys just announced that they've done an interview with Kit Laughlin who along with people like Tom Kurz and Pavel Satsalun is one of the OG names in flexibility training so I'm super excited to listen to that podcast episode when it eventually comes out. Um, go check out Lucas's profile it's at Range of Strength. Last up, but certainly not least, is Shane Dowd, a.k.a. Gotrom. Shane runs a website called gotrom.com, that's G-O-T-R-O-M.com, in which he provides practical training to rapidly increase range of motion and fix aches and pains. Uh, Shane has had particular success in helping people deal with femoroacetabular impingement pain, uh, also called FIA pain, and he offers specific guidance on how to deal with this issue, which is becoming more common in society. Shane has a crazy amount of clients and testimonials. He deals with more than 30,000 people around the world. And I always say that the proof of a method is in the metaphorical pudding. If you're looking for a method of training, look at what a particular coach's methods do for their clients, not necessarily for themselves. Uh, Shane, like um, Jeffrey and Lucas, promotes a philosophy of training that I endorse and which is fully supported by the science. Again, you can find Shane at, at GotRom. Welcome to the fifth and final part of the show, where I answer some questions from the audience. The first question is from Suzanne, and she asks, I currently work in finance, but the coronavirus lockdown has made me change my priorities in life, and I'd like to help people improve their health. In particular, I'd like to become a flexibility coach. Is there some type of accredit accredited course I can do to qualify, or do I need to go to university? Thanks for your question, Suzanne. The short answers to your question are no and no. No, there really isn't an accredited course dedicated to flexibility training that you can do to become a certified flexibility coach. If by certified you mean one that fulfills some kind of state or national licensing requirement like a massage therapist needs to do. But that's because I don't think there are actually any state or national licensing requirements in most countries specifically for flexibility coaches. I would say at the absolute minimum you should pursue your certified personal trainer qualification the quality of the course varies depending on the country and the provider, but you need to check that your provider is reputable and make sure that you can obtain insurance to practice afterwards. Ensure that your certification and insurance cover you to teach stretching and weightlifting to your clients, which I think most of them will. Um, Lucas Aaron, aka Range of Strength, who I mentioned in part four of this episode, does offer a certification called Range of Strength Certification, which I think is available via the Real Movement website, but uh, you're better off getting in touch with Lucas himself to discuss the specifics. Regarding university, no, you don't need to go to university to become a flexibility coach. There's this misconception floating around that you need to become a physical therapist or 
an osteopath or a chiropractor to become a flexibility coach. Uh, look, I have the greatest of respect for what physios and osteos and chiropractors do, but being a physical therapist or an osteopath or a chiropractor does not make you the most knowledgeable person when it comes to flexibility. Again, I have the utmost respect for those professions for what they do. But some of the worst advice I've ever seen given regarding flexibility was given by physios and chiros. Um, if you really want to go to university, I'd suggest pursuing a degree in kinesiology or human movement sciences, something with a strong biomechanics component. But again, it isn't at all necessary and you'll do just fine getting your, your personal trainer qualification and just reading up on the scientific basis of flexibility training. Um, I will point out that I'm going to be launching an educational program soon regarding the science of flexibility, which will teach you everything you need to know about the subject because that's my niche, really. Uh, yes, I can and do coach clients how to get more flexible on an individual basis, but it's the science that brings me the most joy. It's really what I live for in life and sharing that information in a way that's easy to digest and implement in your training is precisely why I do what I do. So be sure to keep an eye out for updates regarding that educational program. Uh, the next question is from Ahmed and he asks, if you could recommend only one type of stretch to get the side splits, what would it be? Thanks, Ahmed. Uh, obvious answer, but do the side split. The law of specificity states that you get better at what you practice and you should practice what you want to get better at. By doing the, the standing side split or standing middle split, if that's what you prefer to call it, you can do relaxed stretches by spreading your legs to the side and holding yourself up, up on a chair in front of you to take the weight off your legs. You can remove the chair and do isometric stretches, um, contracting and relaxing your inner thighs and spreading the legs wider after each contraction. You'll certainly get more leverage and therefore more intensity in your adductors that way than by doing pancake stretches. Uh, not that I have anything against pancake stretches. Um, if you want to do them, do them. But I just find standing middle splits more, are more effective at developing both middle splits and the pancake at the same time. Um, you can also allow your legs to slide out to the side and then walk yourself back to standing without using your hands to give you an eccentric stretch, which is a very effective method. Um, you can stick on a weighted vest or hold a kettlebell or dumbbell to turn the isometric and eccentric stretches into loaded stretches. Um, that's it for today's questions. I'm only answering two because I've got a lot of work to do with the upcoming ebook and also developing the content for the educational course I mentioned. Uh, I hope you liked today's episode. Um, any questions, put them in the comments wherever you see this podcast advertised or send me an email at info at flexibilityresearch.com. Please support the show by liking, subscribing and sharing with your friends. Until next time, stay safe and stay flexible.